Yeah, and as as for how racist the history of America is, I'm surprised that it didn't change the color of the flag to just three shades of white. You, know? <laughs> you could have eggshell, alabaster, and clan. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty solid. <laughs> Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Fork Full of Noodles. I'm your host, Chris Mohan. Hey, quick note, what you're about to see uh, throughout this video is from the live virtual comedy shows I'm doing called the Citizen Revolution Comedy Show. So throughout these episodes, you guys are going to hear some people laughing in the background, and that's because it is recorded in front of a live virtual audience uh, in, a, in, in the Zoom showroom so to speak. And if you want to be a part of this, if you want to be a part of these live virtual events, you can grab tickets for future shows right now. They're happening every single Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. So you can grab your tickets. Go to the, go to the description. Check out the link for these shows. Come join us. Uh, and I'm going to be donating a portion of the ticket sales to various different grassroots organizations, activists, journalists, and small business venues. Uh, every single week it'll be different material. Every single week it'll be a different um, organization or venue that I will be helping out. So that's, uh, that's something that you can, you can be a part of if you choose so. So grab your tickets. Now on to the episode. Before we get into this week's episode, I just want to let you guys know that content like this is often suppressed. So uh, I need your help to make sure that people see this video. Uh, so make sure you hit the subscribe button. Make sure you hit the like button if you enjoy this stuff. And if you want to support uh, this show and, and all of the, the content that I produce uh, on a weekly basis, you can become a sustaining member over on my website at ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate. You can become a sustaining member directly on my website or via Patreon. And you get a bunch of uh, cool stuff. You get early access to longer full episodes of Fork Full of Noodles. You get uh, unreleased uh, stand-up comedy and storytelling stuff. You get free tickets to virtual and live stand-up comedy shows. Uh, so go to ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate uh, and consider becoming a sustaining member or making a one-time donation. Now, on to the episode. Now, as we did mention, the FBI was targeting the Black Panther Party and believed them to be a dangerous organization. And I know some folks might be thinking, hey, Krish, come on, you also mentioned that they were pretty aggressive towards the cops and such. So, you know, this would make sense. But the FBI wasn't involved with the Black Panthers when Cop Watch was put into place. They were too busy harassing Martin Luther King Jr. in 1965. Mm. Yeah, that's a true statement. They were sending him letters. Uh, I believe J. Edgar Hoover called him the most dangerous Negro in America. So, uh, yeah, fun facts about the FBI. Here's when the FBI set their minds to destroy the Black Panthers. It's when the Black Panthers started their nonviolent survival programs. Hmm. After his arrest in 1966, Bobby Seale was released from prison three years later, right? This is before all the stuff that we saw uh, a little bit ago. Now, upon his return to the party, he decided to implement more community-based programs. He called them survival programs, which had lasting effects in our country's history. Okay, these survival programs fell in line with the 10 points that the Panthers believed in and were necessary because the government was not taking care of any of these communities. One of the major things the Black Panthers did was enact Medicare for All within their communities. Hmm. And they did this by having Dr. Tobert Small talk to pharmaceutical companies to donate medicine and uh, doctors and nurses that volunteered at the George Jackson Free Clinic to ensure that people would have the checkups that they need despite all of their incomes. 
So check this out. So that is Tobert Small, Dr. Tobert. Dr. Tobert Small was a physician to the Black Panthers, though he wasn't a party member. They were not just people in black jackets carrying guns. They were interested in actually doing something for the community. The Black Panthers focus more on what they call survival programs, things like food assistance, free education, free legal aid. And one of their top priorities was free community health care. Most of our civilized countries will provide these services for the people. The Panthers realized that we didn't have a civilized country. We were not providing these services for the people. As a young doctor, Small treated political activists like Angela Davis and George Jackson in prison. And when Bobby Seale issued a directive for all chapters to establish free health clinics in 1970, the Black Panther Party turned to Dr. Small to help build the program. I had all the pharmaceutical companies donating medicines to the George Jackson Free Clinic. Mm -hmm. I had doctors volunteering, nurses volunteering, med techs volunteering. Their mm. The wild part about that is that Dr. Small wasn't a party member. He was just a good Samaritan that saw what the Black Panther Party decided to do and started helping them. Now, Bobby Seale put him in charge uh, to test as many black folks as he could for sickle cell, which was a disease that was plaguing the black community very specifically. The government had less than $100,000 in their budget allocated for this. Sickle cell name was a disease that affected uh, mostly black folks. Sickle cell is the single most common genetic disease in the United States, and the vast majority of patients are African-American. It's painful and deadly. And in 1970, the country only allocated less than $100,000 in funding. We spent $7.8 million on muscular dystrophy, $1.6 million on cystic fibrosis, $8 million to get a man on the moon. And obviously, sickle cell anemia was not a priority. Mm. Now, to be fair, the government had to murder a bunch of Asians in Vietnam and that was important because, you know, c communism, which, <laughs> yeah, guys, I don't want to scare anybody here, but communism has never actually set foot in America, which is why it's so dangerous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> guys, that means that it doesn't even need feet to destroy freedom. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here's the thing. You know, for as much as we are afraid of the reds in America, it's a wonder that we even kept that color on the flag, right? <laughs> yeah, and as, as for how racist the history of America is, I'm surprised that it didn't change the color of the flag to just three shades of white. You, know? <laughs> you could have eggshell, alabaster, and clan. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty solid. Now, the media was obsessed with the Panthers and their look. I mean, come on, they look badass, right? And they've kind of become the iconic look for what a revolutionary is supposed to be. The leather jackets, the berets, the afros, and Bobby Seale took advantage of that to shine a light on all of the survival programs that the Panthers had going for them. Self-proclaimed dreamer John Lennon invited Bobby Seale and a few other party leaders on national television to talk about their survival programs that they put into place, which eventually led to President Richard Marion Nixon signing a legislation to find this uh, cure for sickle cell anemia. So check this out. John Lennon invited Black Panther members and collaborators to appear on one of the most popular talk shows of the day, The Mike Douglas Show. And they seized the platform to address the problem of sickle cell disease. We've tested 30,000 people in sickle cell for sickle cell anemia. I think we've tested more than anybody in the country. And just like that, sickle cell became part of the national conversation. The Panthers used their medical infrastructure to run tests for sickle cell in cities all over the country. So it is objectively true that one of the defining public health initiatives of the early 1970s wasn't launched by the U.S. government, but by an organized group of socialist advocates. The initiative gained so much momentum that President Nixon signed legislation to aid research on finding a cure for the disease. So, just in case everybody forgets real quick, the Panthers were actually enacting Medicare for All. And that means that Medicare for All 
can work, but it's just out of sheer callousness and greed from both parties that they continue to block it. And even Nixon kind of did a socialist thing. <laughs> wait, wait for it. That's again, the conservatives are having a stroke at just that statement being into the ether. <laughs> So here's the most famous of all of the survival programs, which was their free breakfast for kids program. Look, the Panthers noticed that uh, kids were getting fatigued and distracted in school. So uh, they realized that was coming from a lack of nutrition in the morning. So they decided to make sure that all of the kids in their community would be fed. On the first day, they fed about 11 kids. And by the end of their first week, they fed 135. Oh, wow. Yeah. And by the end of the year, they, they were feeding about 20,000 kids across 90 cities. This is what former, uh, how do they do it, right? So this is what uh, former Panther Bill X Jennings points out. Uh, he says every op office was supposed to send two people so that they could learn how the program worked and start one in your area. And again, I want to point out that this idea was whitewashed as the Sith from the Star Wars franchise took this idea for nefarious deeds. <laughs> the Sith basically gentrified the rule of two, you guys. That's what they did. So the reason why this was so important is that this pro program transformed a lot of things within the party itself, right? Men were in the kitchen cooking for children in the 60s and 70s. Women mm. were out there holding guns and leading the charge of these programs. They broke gender norms. The image of the revolutionary went from leather jackets and berets to an apron and a spatula. That's amazing. Mm. Bill X Jennings calls this one of the biggest and baddest things that they ever did. And the Panthers are living proof that kindness, compassion, and community are the real revolutions. Hmm. And then in 1965, six years after the origin of the Panther Survival Program, Nixon instituted hmm. the breakfast program in every public school. And that is a direct result of the Black Panther Party. Wow. Yeah. No idea. Yeah, not a lot of people did. And this was the only thing that they were doing. Right, it wasn't just breakfast and, and the healthcare stuff. They enacted free ambulance rides for people, free dental checkups. That's right, you get dental with the Black Panther Party. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh, dude. Yeah, they had free busing to prisons so that you could see incarcerated loved ones. Mm -hmm. They had a free clothing and shoe program. Hell, they would even take kids off of the yards of the elderly and shook their fists at them, you know? <laughs> It was just a variation of the black power symbol, right? It said black power, but also get the fuck off my lawn, you young whippersnapper. Huh? <laughs> mm -hmm. And this, my friends, is where the FBI comes in. As the success of these programs designed to help the American population grew, so did J. Edgar Hoover's and, and Richard Nixon's paranoia. And actually there was a contest between Hoover and Nixon on who could be the more paranoid, racist, wrinkly old white man. Mm. Quite the contest. Mm. <laughs> J. Edgar Hoover said that these survival programs represent the best and most influential activity going on for the BPP. And as such is potentially the greatest threat to the effort by authorities to neutralize the BPP and destroy what it stands for. That's right, folks. Oh, wow. According to the FBI, the greatest threat to the nation were kids with full bellies and medicine. Oh. <laughs> so, to break that down just a little bit, J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI said that a positive thing for low-income communities was a threat to the state and that these programs are exactly what the Black Panther Party stands for and they have to destroy that. So essentially, they are going to run a covert counterintelligence coup against the American people. And that is the most accurate word for the FBI. 
counterintelligence. <laughs> because everything in that statement is counter to the intelligence of a well-run society and government. Just stupid. <laughs> so, this program was called Co-Intel Pro or Counterintelligence Pro. Uh, <laughs> you guys know when you guys download an app and there's like a free version of that app, they call it like the light version, right? And then when you purchase the full oh, version yeah. called the Pro, yeah, this was basically the full version of Counterintelligence, right? The light <laughs> version was just like profusely using the N-word way too much, like all the time. You know, and also indiscriminately killing black people. Like they also did that. That was also part of the light program. But this, but this pro version, boy, that was really going to take that Jim Crow cake. We're going to nail it. There were 290 counterintelligence programs and 245 were dedicated to the Black Panthers. That's 85% of their dumbassery that was targeted at a group that was helping feed kids. And I gotta say, I wanna, I know some people might get mad, but dumbassery is a synonym of counterintelligence. So that's a <laughs> super accurate statement. Here's the thing, to, to J. Edgar Hoover, any type of black organizing was a threat to the status quo. The status quo being over-policed and poor communities of color that don't say anything when injustice happens in their communities. He wrote in COINTELPRO uh, that it was set to expose, disrupt, misdirect, discredit, neutralize the so-called black nationalist movements. Check this out. The purpose of this new counterintelligence endeavor is to expose, disrupt, misdirect, discredit, or otherwise neutralize the activities of black nationalists. Neutralize could mean making somebody an informant or putting somebody in jail or having somebody killed. So the term neutralize was just like a feel good word for state sponsored murder. Huh. Yeah. Now, see, this is the type of dis disruption that the Democrats and the Republicans can really get behind. You know, if you protest killer cops and disrupt the daily life of complacent Americans, you are dubbed a terrorist. But if you imprison and kill organizers by propagandizing the narrative, you're a valued government official. Mm. Now, the FBI would create suspicion by following Panthers, tap their phone lines, harassing family members, and even send letters of infidelity to loved ones. Oh, the FBI was coming around, my mother-in-law and my wife, and uh, um, for me to stop that kind of activity, I stopped going home. And a lot of other people did also to protect their families. You could kind of, in a sense, say we abandoned our families for the Panther Party. Yeah, every person involved in COINTELPRO was the school's fucking hall monitor, right? That would tell on you and go to the principal if, if they caught you kissing in the, in the hallway, mm -hmm. you know? These guys are wound up so tight that this program should have been called COINCELPRO. You guys get it? <laughs> <laughs> That's a solid joke, you guys. You guys gave me like a B plus response. <laughs> so uh, they use these letters to create informants and uh, they were very opportunistic about misdemeanors from young black men they would use to infiltrate uh, the Black Panther Party. Uh, and this was to fulfill one of the mission statements that the FBI had to destroy the Panthers. So here's how they, uh, would create informants. My recruitment by the FBI was very efficient, very simple, really. Um, I'd stole a car and uh, went to the state limit, state limit. limit. and, and um, they had a potential case against me, and I was looking for an opportunity to uh, work it off. And um, a couple of months later, that opportunity came when uh, uh, FBI agent Roy Mitchell asked me to uh, go down to the local office of the Black Panther Party and 
try to uh, gain membership. Mm. Yeah. Mm. They wanted to prevent the appeal of a radical political movement on the black youth, right? They basically wanted to uncool the revolution by showing everybody how great it could be if you're, you know, like a paranoid, delusional racist that hasn't seen their dick in 30 years. <laughs> what a cool <sighs> thing, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> J. Edgar Hoover took this paranoia and he went on national television claiming that the Panthers were a dangerous terrorist organization. You know all those terrorist organization and dictators always like feeding children and clothing the poor, you know, delivering <laughs> medicine, uh, man, helping the elderly cross the street. All those dictators doing that. What a bunch of manies. Huh? You guys remember mm -hmm. how... Al Qaeda was like just trying to deliver like a plane, plane full of pizza on 9-11 to hardworking Americans, mm. you know? And no. then there was just like <laughs> too much pizza grease on the instruments, huh? Oh man. Oh God. Oh boy, those ter goofy terrorists, huh? Those goofballs. No. Because he made that public statement on national television, this let the cops drop whatever little civil liberties they were respecting to go guns a-blazing to kill some Panthers. The Panthers uh, were a criminal organization, were violent, and they wanted to kill cops. That's all I needed to know. About 40 policemen arrived on the scene and began surrounding the Black Panther headquarters. They were trying to change government as we know it through terrorist uh, activity. We took a very proactive stance in combating what we consider a terrorist organization. I think the FBI manipulated the police. The FBI arranged for the Black Panthers to get guns through informants. They would convince the police that the Panthers had weapons. They had to go in and be ready to be shot at, so the police went in and shot at them first. You hear about raids uh, taking really? place against Black Panther officers. They were coming to kill us. Police say there was sniper fire throughout the early morning hours. So they moved in cautiously and then began shooting. The black oh my God. So the FBI manipulated various departments of uh, uh, various different like police departments by spinning these wondrous tales of, of these Black Panthers that would transform into literal Black Panthers. You know, with like Gatling guns on their backs. <laughs> yeah. And there, there were also some rumors that the FBI was spreading where, where they could also turn into that tiger from He-Man. You guys remember that? <laughs> yeah. So just a, a little recap there is the cops are the ones that started escalating things with the Panthers first. Mm -hmm. And then the FBI not only excused this, but they fanned their flames. which might go to show that paranoia is actually a contagious virus. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it doesn't even end there. The cops not only raided Panther pads and uh, Panther HQs, but also just arrested scores of rank and file members. And one of these, the largest examples of this was when the entire party leadership of the New York City Black Panther Party was arrested on a bombing conspiracy charges with absolutely no evidence, right? Because, and they became known as the Panther 21, because every illegally racist crime needs to have a fun name for like the t shirts and stuff, you know? Oh, God. <laughs> uh. A New York grand jury has indicted 21 alleged Black Panthers on charges of plotting several bombings in the city tomorrow. On April 2nd, 1969, in the pre dawn raids, 21 Black Panthers were charged with all kinds of terrorist activity. These are some of the men the police are accusing of being involved in the plot which could have wounded or killed scores of busy New Yorkers. 12 men were arrested today, two are already in jail, and seven more are still at large. And so the Panther 21 started. He was uh, one of the kids that was arrested. <laughs> He's 16. So, you know, they were trying to raise money for the Panther Defense Funds to pay these extraordinarily high legal fees. Um, and it was too much for just regular people to, uh, to pay for. So they had to recruit famous people like Jane Fonda and Marlon Brando, 
right? And after 13 months of trials and retrials, they were found innocent. Hmm. Yeah. After a 13-month yeah. trial, where New York State spent millions of dollars and put dozens of witnesses and hundreds of pieces of evidence, a jury deliberated for three hours. The jury have considered all the counts and charges against the defendants and have found them not guilty. <laughs> There were 156 not guilty verdicts. Mm. That was astonishing. Yeah. Courtroom erupted. The city erupted. There were people dancing in the streets as word spread. Come on over. Juries, defendants, everybody, we're all here. 640 Broadway. Most of the defendants have been in jail for more than two years, unable to raise the high bail set for mm. The trial lasted eight months. Mm. The jury reached its verdict of innocent on all counts in less than four hours, including the longest criminal proceeding in New York State right. history. What it was on the part of the jury to mm. me, I don't know how each individual juror feels, but together they have rejected once and for all a society which refuses to allow change. They said, you must allow people to get together and think about changing life and the way they live. And it, it's a beautiful victory. So this was the full sweep of tactics that the FBI used, right? They went after the Panthers as violently as they could. They depleted their people power by arresting them. They depleted their economic resources with, with, and hung them up in, in litigation so that they couldn't focus on the survival programs, which by the way, continued to thrive despite all of this FBI fuckery. They used manipulation so that kids would stay hungry. That's what the FBI represents. They represent starving children. Now this is the craziest part of COINTELPRO. This is the final part of their mission statement and that was to prevent the rise of a black messiah. Yeah, J. Edgar Hoover ah. was terrified yeah, of the rise of a black messiah that would come forth, speak clearly and eloquently, and liberate the working class people against the oppressive government, right? Usually when we have people that are like, speaking of looking for messianic figures, we put them into psychiatric care. But in America, they're granted a high power job with like 100% of the benefits, including dental. They also get dental. <laughs> Yeah. This, this notion of trying to find the Black Messiah is why he directed Bobby Seale to be arrested over an anti-war speech in 1969. And the worst part about it is it led to the death of young Fred Hampton. Now, Fred Hampton, who's the fourth person um, in that picture, uh, was uh, the leader of the Chicago chapter of the Black Panther Party, and he was 20 when he did that. By Age 20, my biggest accomplishment uh, was bonging a beer without <laughs> crying. <laughs> yeah. Now, here's the thing. Fred Hampton was a magnetic speaker, and, and he, had, he was one of the most accomplished Black Panthers around. Right? Fred Hampton was working together with Latin and white gangs, dissolving their disputes and bringing them into the fold. Here's some of the speeches that he had. Bobby Field is going through all types of physical and mental torture. But that's all right, because we said even before this happened, and we're going to say it after this, and after I'm locked up, and after everybody's locked up, that you can jail revolutionaries, but you can't jail a revolution. Right. Mm. You might want to liberate it like Eric Cleave out the country, but you can't run liberation out the country. You might murder a freedom fighter like Bobby Hutton, but you can't murder freedom fighting. Whatever it was, Fred had it. And these people in this class have divided themselves. They say, I'm black and I hate white people. I'm white and I hate black people. I'm Latin American and I hate hillbillies. I'm hillbillies and I hate Indians. So we fight amongst each other. Fred Hampton here in Chicago was the main voice for racial unity. Black Panther Party stood up and said that we don't care what anybody says. We don't think you fight fire with fire, best. We think you fight fire with water, best. We're going to fight racism, not racism, but we're going to fight with solidarity. We worked with organizations such as 
the Young Lords, a Puerto Rican street gang that had become political, and the Young Patriots, hillbillies, Appalachian white boys. I want to introduce a man who come over tonight from another part of town, but he's fighting for some of the same causes we're to, uh, fighting for. Bob Lee, who was our uh, deputy field marshal, had a meeting with them, and he was explaining why we should work together. There's police brutality up here, there's rats and roaches. Uh, there's poverty up here. That's the first thing that we can, we, we can unite on. That's the common thing we have, man. But I want you people to stick together, and I'll stick with black friends, and they'll stick with me, and I know they will. Yeah, hmm. Look, nothing shrivels a racist dick like solidarity that goes beyond melanin content. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And what you just saw there made J. Edgar Hoover's dick go concave. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Ray, Hoover was afraid that Hampton might be the Black Messiah, so he decided to have uh, his personal bodyguard, William O'Neill, uh, who was an M FBI informant, tip off the Chicago Police Department that there were illegal guns in his panther pad. So O'Neill gave them the layout of the apartment and the Chicago Police Department murdered Fred Hampton. And the media lied about it. So this is the last clip we're going to watch. It's a bit long. It's a bit intense. Hang with me. J. Edgar Hoover most feared young whites uniting with the Blacks' struggle. And he was most afraid of a, what he called a, a Black Messiah uh, rising up out of this movement. Fred Hampton was very good at running an organization. He could delegate responsibility. He could spot talent. The one thing that he failed to spot, however, was the FBI plant, who was, of course, his personal bodyguard. I routinely supplied whatever floor plans or diagrams I could. Uh, to the FBI. I, that started in June 1969. I mean, they had a floor plan and keys to the Black Panther headquarters. Close to 12 midnight, William O'Neill came and picked me up and brought me back to our apartment. Chairman Fred had been running 24 seven trying to organize, so he fell asleep. I was uh, eight and a half uh, months pregnant with our son, so I fell asleep too. Police attached to the Cook County State's Attorney's Office raided a Chicago apartment shared by two high-ranking members of the Black Panther Party before dawn today. The police were acting on a tip that a supply of weapons was in the apartment. The State's Attorney recreated the layout of the Panther apartment and uh, made arrangements for them to produce his version of what happened. He stands up, I stand, I stepped over, and I put the machine foot up. Yeah. Short first, we realized that there are still some people remaining. And, and before I could get past the threshold, there were three shots fired from the rear bedroom. The immediate violent criminal reaction of the occupants in shooting at announced police officers emphasizes the extreme viciousness of the Black Panther Party. So does their refusal to cease firing at the police officers when urged to do so several times. When the 15-minute gun battle was over, two Black Panthers were dead. Police and Panthers differ about what happened. In the apartment, we received no warning, no tear gas, nothing to offer us to surrender or, or come out. Bullets start coming through the walls, plaster flying. Saw a bullet coming from it looked like the front of the apartment, from the kitchen area. They were, uh, pigs were just shooting. This cop stepped to the door with a submachine gun, and all you could see was a silhouette. And the uh, muzzle flashes as he fired, you know, a fully automatic weapon into uh, a room that was barely six feet wide. Huh. 
-hmm. I laid on top of Chairman Fred, and I could feel even through him the mattress vibrating. You could feel the bullets going into it. I just knew we'd be dead, everybody in there. Cops stepped back in and uh, fired off another round, hit me in the hips. Everything was like this. It was just going so fast. We told them we were wounded, and they said, come out with your hands up. One of them grabbed my robe, and they swung it open and said, oh, what do you know? We got a broad here. And then another one grabbed my hair and slung me into the kitchen area. I heard a voice say, he's barely alive. He's, he'll barely make it. They started shooting, up, shooting again. I heard a sister scream. They stopped shooting. Pig said, he's good and dead now. It was like a slaughterhouse, and there's blood all over the place. When we lifted the mattress up to look underneath, three 45 caliber machine gun slugs fell out of the mattress. Only one shot came from a Panther weapon because Mark Clark, the young kid who answered the door, was shot in the heart as he answered the door, and the gun dropped and went off through the ceiling. All of the splinters were coming into the apartment. So we said, this was a shooting. It wasn't a shootout. There's gas that the police department uses as standard equipment that nobody can stand to stay in the room with it. They could have shot four canisters of gas in there and waited outside for everybody to come out. Mm. So I'll take a deep breath. So this is what happens when people put down their hatred over melanin content, right? This is what happens when you decide to feed people and clothe people and provide basic needs and show a government that has ignored everybody that we are self-sufficient and don't need their shriveled dicks getting in our way. The Panthers moved towards a peaceful direction and the FBI used the police as a force of violence to run them down. The Panthers ceased to be in 1982, right? Huey Newton, uh, when he got out of prison, was um, he started getting into drugs. He had a lot of depression. Uh, Eldridge Cleaver, who was running violent operations in Algeria, was, was having conflicts with, with Huey Newton. So the FBI would send letters to each of them, instigating them both. The FBI really liked to use this letter writing campaign, right? They were basically like the civil rights deadliest pen pal, you know? <laughs> Not just that, but because the FBI and the cops were harassing their family, the Panthers became isolated to themselves just to make sure that their families would be safe. The FBI made a revolutionary road a lonely one. Now, eventually, Bobby Seale dis distanced himself from the party as well. In fact, he actually ran for mayor in Oakland on Panther philosophies and actions. So Seale in Oakland in the 70s, increased voter registration because people actually wanted to vote for him instead of against his opponent. Go figure, when you run a campaign where you'll ensure that you'll work for the people, the people want to participate in an election. Now, there are those in this society that will keep gaslighting us to believe that socialism is never going to work in America. But the Black Panthers are proof that it will. They were able to provide health care, elder assistance, shelter, food, water to all these communities that the corporate duopoly forgot. The FBI and the police made the Panthers defend themselves and these communities, all these community programs, by forcing them to take up arms. The FBI lied, they cheated, and unfortunately, the American populace fell for it. We were grifted out of a better future. Look, the legacy of the Panthers is not what the media portrays of them. They weren't violent black militants or cop killers. The legacy of the Black Panthers was in the work of the rank and file to create community. The words of solidarity from Bobby Seale and Fred Hampton, the intellect of Huey Newton, and even the sass of Eldridge Cleaver, who I remind you, 
said that he would beat the shit out of Ronald Reagan with a marshmallow. <laughs> yeah. What they did was they exposed the underbelly of a paranoid, conspiratorial, corrupt system in every which way. So don't let their history be written by the bad guys that won. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode. If you guys enjoyed this content, please make sure that you hit the like button and the share button. Get this out there to as many people as you can. Send it out to some friends. Send it out to some enemies. Send it out. Put it. Put it in some groups. Um, content like this is often suppressed, and it is up to. Uh, I depend on you guys to share this stuff out and like this stuff to make sure that it's shown to new people, um, and new people learn about this channel. And if you haven't, uh, please hit the subscribe button uh, to make sure that you are getting notifications when we put videos up. I'm going to be putting videos up every single week on this channel, content like this, uh, more, more scripted uh, comedy content. There will be some rantier content, some audio content, some interview stuff uh, coming up as well. Um, these, what you're seeing in these videos is from the Citizen Revolution live virtual comedy shows uh so if you are a a a fan of uh this this sort of stuff and you want to see it live uh in a virtual setting of course um please uh, get tickets for these shows um what I'm doing with these shows is 50% uh, of the ticket sales is going to a grassroots organization, uh, activists, uh, journalists, venues across the country, people that really need help uh, that aren't being helped by, uh, by, by the federal government right now. So, so it's up to us to help each other out. And this is, this is me doing my part. Uh, so since I talk about these larger ideas, these socially conscious topics, uh, in my comedy, I figured I should. Um, I, I wanted to donate to uh, to groups that stand for these these causes and issues and ideas that I uh, talk about often, uh, especially on this channel. This particular show, uh, I donated 100% of the ticket sales to the Black Visions Collective in Minneapolis, Minnesota. They are a uh, POC queer driven community-based uh, organizers that are helping out protesters that have uh, been wrongfully arrested for the act of protesting. So I donated 100% of the ticket sales to that. So if, if you're watching this video, you weren't able to make it to the to live stand-up comedy show where we discussed the Black Panthers and you want to donate to the Black Vision Collective, the links are in the description below. So please check out the links, uh, the ticket links and the donation links and um, make sure that you share. Um, like I said, the, the Citizen Revolution comedy shows, they happen every Friday at 9 p.m. If you want to, you can, um, you can, you can check out all of the dates uh, on my website at ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N noodlescomedy.com. Uh, as a, a full-time touring performer that has basically lost a majority of, uh, of my work, uh, being a touring performer, uh, these virtual comedy shows, sustaining memberships and album sales are pretty much how I'm going to be earning my living right now. And it's also a way that I can um, continue to help, uh, like I said, grassroots organizations, activists, journalists, and small business venues that I've worked with across the country uh, that are um, that are, that are kind of struggling right now. So uh, yeah, so if you want to uh, check out the links in the description, but make sure you hit that subscribe, make sure you hit that share button, make sure you hit that like button and get the word out. Uh, you can follow me on a bunch of social media stuff at Krish Mohan Ha Ha and stay tuned for more videos because we are going to be uh, putting up weekly videos on this channel uh, discussing big topics like this, discussing topics that you don't normally see on, uh, on any sort of mainstream media or uh, any sort of mainstream comedy channels. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Until next week, see you.